if there's someone that doesn't need any introduction <laughs> um, and that we're so proud having here with us is uh, Paolo Coelho. And um, I mean, really, uh, Paolo, can you come up on stage? Uh, Paolo is here with us. We have, uh, we're very, very, very pleased to have you, Paolo. Welcome. Welcome, Paolo. And Kathy, I think, you know, if you, your, your voice is going down, so I'll just sit with you, but do you like if I was not there? Please sit. Hello. Is it working? Is on? Yes, it is working. Yeah. Welcome, Paolo. Thank you, Louis. I'll just sit here. So, Paolo, I think that first that maybe we should talk about this experimental witch project. Maybe you can enlighten the audience on this fantastic project that you have undertaken with uh, related to one of your books? Well, one year ago, I had this idea out of the blue because I always refused to sell the rights of my books to movies because I think that a movie takes place in the head of the reader. So I was very reluctant for many, many years till the day that I thought to myself, why don't I do a, a movie with my readers? And the ideal book was The Witch of Portobello because it has 15 characters. And you can choose. Uh, I, pu I posted in my blog, paulocoelhoblog.com, then I started having partnerships. First it was HP, then it was Prisma Press in, in France, then it was uh, Burda in Germany, but supporting the project. And finally MySpace jumped in. By July 2008, this year, I had close to 6,000 movies and, 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 and movies and, and music. I forgot one thing, I forgot to put a time frame. So at the end of the day, I had, uh, when we selected the 15 winners, we had a movie that was nearly five hours, which is nonsense, of course. So we had to cut it down and now we are going to broadcast basically in the internet uh, before going to the festivals. Because if you consider the movie festivals, you are going to consider also that people go to movie festivals and you see wonderful movies there. And at the end of the day, the only way that you can find these movies is in BitTorrent. You don't see anywhere else but in BitTorrent. So I thought, why don't you do a kind of world premiere, let's say 20, uh, 9 o'clock p.m. in every country. And I'm discussing that currently with some uh, major platforms to have it there. How do you feel about that? Uh, we, we were in Avignon together two weeks ago, right? So how do you feel about this? Uh, BitTorrent doesn't, is not specifically the best place to protect your offer rights, right? Well, <laughs> <laughs> this discussion about copyrights, uh, I think from, from the book business, from the book perspective, piracy is something that should be stimulated. Every writer should say, I'm a pirate myself, because somehow people download books and they cannot read online. So they go and buy a book, which I decided, that's why I decided to put in my site a thing called Pirate Coelho. So if any one of you pirate want, want to pirate any of my books, <laughs> You are welcome to do that. Uh, I only have the rights for the Brazilian uh, 
well, version because I write in Portuguese and I don't have the rights for French or American or Croatian or Japanese. So what I do is to collect the links from my readers. Sometimes they scan, sometimes they type, sometimes they even translate books that are not yet translated. And then I put the links there and then the publishing house comes to me and say, oh, this is not legal. <laughs> we have the rights. But I said, well, it's not my fault. I am just putting a link. It's not me who part. And so I managed to, to somehow to go beyond the limits of legality. But for a book, this is very important. Uh, I based that on an experience in Russia in 1999. I had sold, let's say, less than 10,000 copies in Russia. And I found a pirate copy of The Alchemist in the in internet. I said, I have nothing to lose. Let's put this pirate edition. People can download for free. The translation is not that good. And so the next year, I had uh, moved over 100,000 copies sold in Russia. And two years after, I was over one million copies. So I realized that piracy was helping me, was not hurting the sales of my books. So I decided to elaborate more and more. And today, when I look back, when I look to the present moment, what I do see is that uh, I'm selling more books than ever because this idea of being greedy, of trying to stop the share of information does not help books. You have to share in order to, to somehow to get some revenue from it. So how do the publishing companies, I don't know when this happened, how, how do the publishing companies... I, I think you're so <laughs> impressed to be with Paolo. I'm so choked up. I read Katya's blog today. <laughs> Because we had a dinner <laughs> three days ago to organize the meeting. And so I went there, we had this dinner. And she was describing her blog. How did she feel? She felt nervous. She felt butterfly in her stomach. Apparently what? my butterflies are in my throat. Why, why, why? <laughs> Am I threatening now? Ah, not at all. Okay. Not at all. Do you want me to read your questions, Kathy? You can read my questions. No, but how do your, how do your publishers feel about this, though? How you, do your publishers feel about this? You can translate it. Yes. Me, because they have to make money. I, I apologize for the bad English accent, though, but uh, so how do your publishers feel about this? Well, the first reaction, uh, they said, it is not good. This is going to stop the sales of, of your books. So I got a phone call from my American publisher because it became news. I, I spoke in GLD, the, the, the event in Germany, and I spoke out of the blue, and, and people were very interested in, in, in this idea. So there were news. And I got a phone call from the CEO of HarperCollins then. Her name is Jane Friedman. And when Jane Friedman calls you, you are paralyzed by fear. It's not easy, you know? She's a good friend of mine. But still, I, I, I'm totally intimidated by her. And Jane said, Paulo, we have a problem. Like Houston, we have a problem. And I said, I know what you're talking about, uh, Jane. Yes, you know, people are calling us, blah, blah, blah. And but I said, well, I cannot take it back. I said that in front of everybody. And by the way, these links were there for two years. So uh, she said, let's create something different. And then HarperCollins developed a software that you can read the book online, but you cannot download the book online. So we managed. And the other publishers, they, they, they did not say anything. But let me give you a very good example. 
Three months ago, I decided to write books or to use some texts that uh, I had. And I made three books, one of them in five languages and the other two in two languages or three languages. And I put it there for free download. Books only for internet. And I had up to this day over one million downloads of these books. How many comments did I get out of these three, three, three titles? Zero. Meaning people download, they read, and they think, oh, I'm going to buy the hard copy uh, when it is available. So what does it mean? It means that the fact that you have the book there for free it does not hurt your sales. And I get many, many emails saying, when this book, it's called The Way of the Bow, because I normally do archery. This is my, my favorite sport. And uh, so I wrote a book on archery, but not about archery techniques, but about, about uh, the metaphor of being an archer. Uh, and then, uh, I put the book there, and so far I did not get a single, single comment, because people don't have the hard copy. Meanwhile, I get over 400 emails a day commenting my books that we're having hard so copy. So how do you deal with that? Can you tell the story, while uh, Cathy still recovers with the tea, can you tell the story, Paolo, on how you invited the readers for a, a dinner in your house, right? You told me that story. This is so amazing because Paolo blogs, and if you've not checked Paolo's blog, you should. And you publish videos. You you do like you tweet as well. You you're on different social software. But one day you decided to invite everybody home, right, for a party. Not everybody. Not everybody. <laughs> come on. <laughs> By the way, Twitter. I had to film it because people. Oh, it's not Paolo Coelho tweeting here. So uh, well, I went and I filmed. It. I'm tweeting, you see me tweeting, and then I, 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 I upload on YouTube. Now people believe that I tweet, because otherwise they think that I'm very busy. I'm not very busy. Nobody's very busy to have fun, because I think that at the end of the day, back to piracy, I'm going to answer your question. Take your time. The goal of any artist is to share his work. So. As a writer, I start writing not to earn money. I start writing because I want people to read my books. And I think that every single writer does this because he or she wants to be read. Every single musician, every single painter wants to have his work or her work uh, somehow commented or, or seen by other people. So this is the basic idea of content. <coughs> Contents we provide because we want to share. So when you're talking here about business model, this is a different conversation. We should have it too. Yeah. Right after that, we'll, I'd love your yeah. thoughts on the current times and how you know it yeah. involves but change then, creation. Yeah. Bank, then back to the party. Every 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 year I I give one party to my friends. And by the way, let me go uh, fast forward, uh, f uh, rewind a little bit the tape. The idea of the blog was the same idea as the party. I took the Trans-Siberian train to go from Moscow to Vladivostok because it was something that I had a dream about going from Moscow to Vladivostok. And I thought, but to make this travel alone, this is nonsense. Why don't create a blog? Because then uh, people can travel with me, I can share my impressions, etc. Which I did. And then I got caught in this blogger's world. <laughs> well, look at, look at that. You have a few people <laughs> caught here as well. And then <laughs> I started with, uh, well, 500 visitors and 100 and blah, blah, blah. And 
one, one year ago, I had this idea. Well, every year I give one party to my friends. And at the end of the day, my readers are my friends. So. Who are your friends, Paolo? My friends are people like you, for example, Luke. Well, but, but that's <laughs> another for, for me. Thank Katches you. Catch is a new friend. But like but, your readers, if your readers are but, your friends, but, you have many friends. I think you yeah, have exceeded the Facebook limit here of 5,000 friends. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of you course. You have, right? Of course. <laughs> but I'm talking to this friend that will go and have dinner and stay in a bar for 10 hours doing nothing and drinking and smoking. Smoking you cannot anymore, but at least drinking <laughs> and going outside and smoking a cigarette and going inside and, and, and then drinking again. So... Uh, I thought to myself, why not invite the 10 first readers that write to this address to come to my party? They are going to represent, I think we are, over, we are, we are now over 130 million books sold, which makes close to 500 million readers, considering the ratio three readers per per book. So I said, the first 10 people who write to this address, they're my guests. And I, I got immediately 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 emails. And one from Japan, one from Venezuela, two from Spain, one from England. And I said, they, they got me wrong. They think that they, I'm paying their bill, the tickets, everything. Because I said, Japan, you know, Qatar. There was someone from, that was in the army, in the US army. Uh, and I said, let me send an explanation to these people and say, I'm not paying your ticket. I am just invite you to my party. And they said, no, we understood. And I said, the party lasted two hours, three hours maximum, no more than that. No, we understand that. So I got these readers. At that moment, it was only my blog. And then this year, I had another party, this annual party that I gave. Uh, and then I went up to 40 readers, 10 from MySpace, 10 from Facebook, 10 <laughs> from my blog. and. And, and, and then, uh, if, uh, I don't remember. And, and then I think this personal connection is very important because people used to say, at least there is something that I don't understand about writers. They, they have this tendency to detach themselves from this contact with readers. Although you need this contact. Well, you can tell the room is empty, right? Yeah. <laughs> now so you, how need, about you need this contact. <laughs> you need this contact because at the end of the day, every, everybody has something interesting to say. And, uh, and this is what we did. Uh, uh, now, using all the social communities, not only I'm sharing stories, but I'm also somehow asking my reader to comment in this on that current affair. So it, it all, that also speaks to me to the creative process, though. So you speak to your readers, your readers speak to you. How does technology and your ability to reach out to people like this, how does that change the way you write? How does, it, uh, how does technology <laughs> change the way you write? I love that your you're work. How does it change? Yeah, I do a shortcut. Funny. It's like lost in translation, right? You know, that's a French way. It's I think that that started with the word processor. Back to 1990, when I wrote my first book using a word processor, that it was Breda. It was before The Alchemist. It was after The Alchemist, that was my second book, and The Pilgrimage, that was my first book. So when I was in front of this word processor, using still DOS, DOS, huh? and I said, my God, this is going to change everything. Makes your writing easy. Makes your writing more, more direct. Makes your writing, you can change things. Uh, of course, you have to print. Nothing can substitute a final correction on a printed paper. You have to see the paper and then make the final corrections. 
But then after with internet, etc., that you start writing and going straight to the point. At the end of the day, internet is, web is a written media. You write, you read. Of course, there are movies, there are images, etc. But what you want to do is to chat, is to send an email, etc. So you start to condense your ideas in a few sentences. It's like to be a lyricist for rock. You have to be direct without being superficial. And but just Kathy, on, on this one, the uh, don't we had Philip Stark here last year at your seat that 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 you know I guess and Philip. Stark started explaining that actually in a creation process, what he likes is to lock himself or like just watch the ocean and not being, he actually even, you know, uses words like, you know, being spoiled, right? Being like taken into, you know, like negative, you know, like don't you think we lose quality as well? If you get 500 emails a day, which I'm sure you get more than that, many of them must, you know, like, how about quality versus quantity? Do you, do you, do you not, like, lock yourself to write? You, you see what I mean? Let's separate two things here. A, any creative process is a different one. B, I had this dream of a writer sitting in this mountain in front of this lake with this beautiful lodge you know, a fireplace there, my laptop, writing the book of my life, which I did. <laughs> I went to this place in the Pyrenees, and I wrote a book that was my most boring book <laughs> I ever wrote, because I was totally disconnected from reality. So, Every time that I write a new book, I live a total normal life. I walk, I read my newspaper, I postpone it. This is the problem. Because you said, OK, I'm going to start writing at 11 o'clock. Then you say, oh, I have to answer some emails. <laughs> and then you go to 12 o'clock. Then, oh, I have to eat. Then I have to read the newspaper. And then you start postponing. And then you meet your friends. But there is this creative tension that is building up, building up, building up. And then at 7 o'clock, just for you not feel guilty or me not feel guilty, I say, OK, I'm going to, have to write half an hour just to say to myself that I wrote today. And then somehow you get caught in this energy. And then you write for five hours nonstop. But the, in my case, my texts, they need to be touched by this energy of life. Huh? So I cannot isolate myself. I can isolate myself and live a monastic life when I'm not writing. But when I'm writing, I need to socialize, I need to meet people. I need not to think 24 hours a day that I'm going to write that day. Because then somehow, a sentence, a moment, something like this will be, will be uh, in my book, even if I'm not conscious that this is going to interfere. So yeah, we'll take do you want water? Of course, I'll take care of it. <laughs> I'll take care of it. <laughs> my mic is... <laughs> well, no, no, yeah. Um, Kathy, you should ask one question. <laughs> So what about I will translate. There you go. What about user-generated content? So with the Witch of Portobello, with the Experimental Witch Project, this was something that content came in from your readers from all over the world. How do you see that now maybe becoming part of the process and changing the dynamic of how creatives can create in the future? <laughs> For anybody Maybe who French? didn't understand me. <laughs> Dans le process de création. <laughs> no, no, yeah, because I don't people hear, heard you. No, I people think it's, uh, well, how, how you see artists, you know, changing with, uh, adapting their process of creation. 
based on all the user-generated content, and then we'll take a question. We have uh, some time left for you, and we should share our time with you with the room. So if we can have um, uh, people preparing questions, if you, you could prepare some questions if you want, and if you could have the mic ready for Paolo for the questions. So content, well, life is about content. My life is interesting or boring if I have a good content or if I have bad content. Huh? And the only way that you have uh, to improve your quality of life is by meeting people. Of course, you need sometimes to be alone. You need sometimes to be by yourself. But you need to meet people in order to fulfill your meaning of being here. Because part, the most important part of human condition is to share this human condition. We do that since the, the dawn of time. So we did that in the caverns. We did that, you know, when you go to Lascaux, when you go to Altamira, what you see there is art, is content. What they hunt is long gone, but the art are still there. So I think that at the end of the day, contents either in internet or in real life is what justifies life. So first question from, from the room. Uh, can you introduce yourself for, uh, for Paolo? And who, who would like the next question? OK, well, get ready, this first one. Hi, so uh, my name is Axel Schmiglo. I'm from uh, Seven Load. Uh, we're a social media site, so on our site, uh, content producers share predominantly video content, but also uh, other types of content. Uh, <laughs> you really got me going with uh, your comments on, on how you interact with the community and uh, on copyright. Uh, I also remember that in 95, John Perry Barlow said that, that the internet was the end of copyright and that that would change the way content owners uh, present themselves uh, not by selling what they have produced, but by selling who they are. Um, is that what you do? Do you see a, a different way of interacting with, with your readers? Could you go as far as, as what Stephen King did, where suddenly uh, users, even beyond the project uh, that you did with video, would start influencing how you design a plot or how you fashion a character? I mean, is that something you can fathom? No, I cannot do that. I cannot go to that extent that Stephen King uh, went by creating a book together with his readers. For me, a book is a very intimate thing. It's a kind of personal relationship with myself. I write books to understand better myself. So for this, of course, I meet people, etc. But, but I cannot go that far. Having said that, the idea of copyright is started together with the printing process, the movable type printing process by Gutenberg. So when we start having the first mass production of an artist object called book, that at the end of the day was responsible for Renaissance. It was thanks to the possibility of an idea traveling from A to B under the form of a book that uh, we had changed the whole world, influencing arts, etc., like the movement we see and we call today as Renaissance. That said, uh, what we see now is the opposite. People don't understand. So just to finish the copyright thing, when books start being profitable, they said we have to protect our rights. And then they decided the idea of copyright. They did not have copyright before. What we see now at least as for books, I don't want to elaborate on movies, I don't want to elaborate on music. Huh? I saw that in the movie business, they had a window to 
understand what was going on and to cut a good deal. But instead of sending negotiators, they sent lawyers and just destroyed the whole business. Because at the end of the day, who is going to win? The pirates. They always won. But they still exist. They are in Somalia now. And some of them, if you go back to the 16th century, they became knights, they became sirs, they became lords, you know, but because they conquered the seas. Yeah. But Paolo, you, like, you're, you're immensely popular, and so it's great that the sales are going on so well, but if you have a, um, a writer or in the music industry, you, 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 you have a physical form of a CD, or for a movie completely disappearing, right? Imagine, and it were, I think it we're at this point now, that your book, I can download it, and I can print it to a quality that gets me exactly the same as I buy from your editor. You can do that already. Yes, exactly. So then, if, if, I, if a writer doesn't have you know, that much, you know, of course, um, huge demand as you have, how do they make money? How does one, you know, for, for, right. from the music industry, Let's go back to the very reason why people write. They write to be read. They don't write to make money. Right. If they want to make money, they, they, they are going to be an investment banker. Not today, but probably two years ago. Huh? So you write because you want to share something. And, and then when I start writing, I could never dream that I would make money. I write, I wrote because I want to write. I want to be read. So you're also. telling all the artists just share everything? I'm telling all the artists that there is no harm if you share it. Okay. Probably for the movies, it's much more complicated uh, because it takes a lot of money to invest and then, and then, uh, then you download, you see, and you yeah. don't pay the right. And you don't need a box, right? So. Yeah, yeah. So movies, I think, uh, uh, are quite complicated, and I don't see any foreseeable solution in the, in the, in the, in the end. But don't forget, don't trick yourself by the arguments of some industries, mostly the book industry, that they are defending the money of the author. This is simply not true. <laughs> this is not true. <laughs> because as a writer, I want to be read. And I'm sure that if I share, people are going to understand. They are going to buy the book. It's easy to buy the book. But so you heard, there's a, we take this question, but there's a law in France being prepared to punish uh, everybody downloading anything. And also, we'll have Didier Lombard of Orange you know, coming just after you, but like a little later. But they're trying to even catch the internet service provider, saying, you know, look, if there is a Paolo Coelho book here, we'll tax you. So you, you don't think they should do that? Well, I'm not French, so I cannot talk about this law. What I can talk about is about the system, yeah. not the system the social political system, but this peer to peer system, they will find a way. You know better than anybody else. They close here, they open there. Okay, so they you're like, here. let it go, right? And at the end of the day, if they track down who is pirate my books, they're going to find my IP. I am seeding my books. Please, can you introduce yourself? Hola, Paolo. My name is Sonia. I work for SAP Software, and um, since uh, there's a lot of uh, creative people here and a lot of startups, I wanted to ask you a question about creativity. You've said many times that um, uh, you were 38 the first, the, when you started writing your book, and you've often questioned yourself if it was uh, a good move to start something at, uh, at what you thought back then, uh, kind of a that late stage in life. Um, what... Um, what uh, recommendation, what suggestion do you have for, for people here that um, have um, all kinds of uh, start, start, start up, uh, startups and dreams on how to not let go of their personal legend? 
Well, I would say that take the first step. Don't be paralyzed by your fears. I was 38. Huh? People say, oh my God, it's too late to change your life. But no, it's not too late to change your life. You can change your life anytime you want to change your life. But for this, you have to take your first step with fear, uh, thinking that nobody's going to understand you, etc. But this is what makes life fun. You are doing your work here, blogging, for example. What is the business model for blogging? As far as I know, it's non-existent. Huh? But you still do it. You do it because you like it. And this is what you should do something that justifies your life, is to have fun, is to, to, do, to do something that uh, you, you have fun. So don't think too much. Uh, how about recession? Person. And we'll take one question uh, here and ma uh, manifest yourself if you have one as well later on. But Paolo, we're like, you know, sh like if you read too much of the media these days and TV and, uh, you know, listen to the markets, you're, you're, you get negative, right? I don't get negative, no. I get positive on a business level because the best gift is a book. It's not expensive. So book sales are going <laughs> up. So recession is good so for you. <laughs> at least for, for the booksellers, it's the perfect uh, no, momentum. Probably not for... So, I, well, look, I don't know. You, you are there and you see the, the book sales going up. If you are creating your startup, Pardon? If you're creating your startup, you have entrepreneurship. That would be difficult. That would be difficult. Yeah. You, what, what, what would you do? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not creating a startup. <laughs> okay. We'll take one question here. Can you introduce yourself? Yes. Hello. My name is uh, Gabriel McIntyre, Gabe Mack. My question is going a little bit past the business models and so forth. What I'm seeing on the internet is an exchange and flow of ideas, an exchange and flow of cultures, an exchange and flow of identities, of consciousness. It's a soul that's starting to happen. The tools have now come out with Twitter, with Seismic, with all these different tools. However, understanding how this technology can be used seems to be like the next step and how do we use this in our global consciousness and i see that artists like yourselves are the ones to take the first steps but shouldn't the artists be as important and stimulated as much as the startups themselves to try and figure out what this means for all of us in which sense should we do that in expanding, you know, instead of just using, for instance, a Twitter just to say, you know, I'm going to have a cup of coffee, to try and do something different with it, to try and, you know, make an art piece out of it or, or whatever. It has no monetary value whatsoever, but just to try and understand how we communicate more by giving the tools to the artists that normally would not have even thought of playing with them. I totally agree with you. But it's going to take time. It's going to take time for society to understand the importance of what we are doing, you and some artists. I give you a concrete example. If you want to see a very concrete example, I want to see a movie that won the Cannes Film Festival in 1986. It was called Terres by Alain Cavalier. So I tried to buy, impossible. I tried to rent. I found a, a place in Switzerland. So I put my credit card, blah, blah, blah. And now we have to live in Switzerland to rent this movie. I tried everywhere. The only place that I found it, it was in Demonoid. So, Somehow, these peer-to-peer -peer sites are becoming the real storage of things that the, well, the cultural producers don't want to sell anymore. So what I would suggest is to wait. I know that the internet time uh, is not the real time, but there is no way to convince the society that what you are doing is for good, unless they realize 
And for this, they need to take time. Back to the crisis. This is going to help a lot. Probably not startups now, but people are going to start understanding that they have this gigantic web of information they can share for free. Enough of this, starting with the free platform, making money. But this is going to take a while. We need this collapse that's happening now. When I see the Dow Jones going up, I say, no, 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 go down, 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 because you have to realize that this is a failed model. So until it goes to 5,000, people are not going to realize. But when it goes to 5,000, Dow Jones, then people are going to start thinking, oh, there are some free things, and free will become profitable. So we're, uh, we're, we, we were very lucky to have you here, Paolo. Will you come back next year? If you invite me, Luis. Oh, come on, we, of course. Yeah. So in between, we'll, uh, we can throw a party for you. You, you look you know, like we can invite 10 friends. As you can see, we you know, would love to have more friends <laughs> for you. Okay. I'd like really to stress the importance of having Le Web here in France. I just arrived for Le Web. Thank you. And, and uh, having all these people uh, here, this kind of event is as important as for a writer to meet a reader in the street and, and say, I'm not alone. I think that overall, the whole message of Le Web to 2008 is, I'm not alone. You are not alone. You are discussing. You realize that you have the same problems. And you are going to find creative solutions for that. Thank you very much for your, your attention, your presence here. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you. Peace.